Good morning, everyone Hello. here. Good morning, guys. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Fon. Albert and Sonia. Albert and Sonia. And Jasper. Hi, Jasper. Good morning. Nice of you, everyone, to uh, join us again. This is already the 33rd time that we're doing this. Hi. Hello, Jose. Well, Hello, Jose. this. You say this subject there, you will not really see while snorkeling, or maybe you would. Maybe. Yeah, you could, right? <laughs> you could. You could. I will say. I will tell you a little bit about that. Right. Can Canada is checking in. Hey, hi, Philip. Hi, Dagmar. And uh, nice of you to join us again. And Cindy, how are you, Cindy? Gaat het een beetje beter weer? Yeah, let's hope she's doing all right. So, uh, yeah, for your context, Steve, these are our loyal viewers that have been with us uh, since day one. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of them are uh, our repeating guests, uh, all of them divers or snorkelers. And um, most of them are in Europe and they're having their uh, breakfast uh, coffee. And uh, yep. for some of them, it's uh, become a bit of a ritual. Yeah, so the people from Europe, it's nine o'clock in the morning. But uh, only Philip and Dagmar, they are um, really, really late. They go to bed very late just to see the stream. Hi, Sip. Goedemorgen. And um, yeah, we have our uh, Australian uh, counterpartners, not yet. And women, they see they are there. Um, Matthew and Graham, not yet. They are not from yet. Australia. So um, yeah. we had to move the time of the stream one hour. So it's always dinner time at their place mm. so yeah. yeah so uh everyone thanks a lot for uh, tuning in once again and uh, we are joined uh, this week by uh, stephen haddock uh stephen um please introduce yourself to our viewers uh who are you and what do you do hi uh, my name is steve i'm a researcher in california at a place called the monterey bay aquarium research institute we're not quite the same as the aquarium. We're a sister institution and we don't have public visitors or anything, but um, we do a lot of deep sea research. And um, I work specifically, I have for about the past 25 years, worked on jellies of various kinds that I'll show you about um, today. And also bioluminescence and fluorescence. A lot of them have these remarkable bio-optical properties as well. So we study everything from the genetics to the functions of, of those things. Nice one. And uh, yeah, you've prepared a presentation for us. Mm -hmm. uh, before we get to that though, and I understand it's uh, midnight uh, over in California right now. So once again, thanks a lot for uh, taking the time to do this for us. Uh, we really appreciate Absolutely. it. My pleasure. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I would just like to share with you and everyone else uh, some footage that Satoka and Simone uh, shot during uh, an, a black water dive. Um, and uh, while showing it, maybe you it's not very long, but maybe you could just explain a little bit what's, uh, what we're looking at, because I'm not very sure myself. Uh, one thing though, a little technical issue. When I start the video, uh, this is unfortunately a technical thing that I cannot solve. Make sure you unmute your mic so that everybody can hear you if you want to comment on it, all right? All right. 
Here we go. All right, so um, guys, please don't forget to unmute yourself if you want to comment on this. This, uh, this started as a normal dive. Uh, we were we were actually um, trying to film uh, sea stars, basket stars, and so on. And then this guy passed me by, and it was like, wow, wow, wow. But my camera does not is not uh, compatible to film something like this. So I was calling like crazy to for Satoka with her macro lens, and we saw this this very weird uh, uh, shrimp. It's actually a shrimp. Um, so the footage is, it footage is not very good. And then we saw this one. This looks very, very weird. It has a propeller on the, on one mm. side, which actually was turning around, chasing my light. <laughs> That's a little siphon, of course. So I'll talk about those guys too tonight. Cool. Wow. Look at that. Nice, eh? So we wanted to do more. But unfortunately, the weather was very bad this week, and um, it was really not safe to go for a night dive. So yeah, we have to do it with this uh, very short footage. But we promise you more. And uh, for sure, Steve has a lot. So that that is a sap, yeah. actually. It's different. It's not related to the previous one at all, even though they both have a leading. It's a salt. It's yeah, a salp? The other one, the, yeah. that one was a salp, but this is a siphonophore. So there's two different things that have the same overall appearance, but they're uh, they're not related. There's another salp. Yeah, this was also very cute, and it's so beautiful because it has the colored lights all around. I don't know if it's visible. No, that's an, another one, I think. But that yeah. comes in a little shot. And this was just in in ten minutes at the end of the dive, Steve. Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah. I have a photo of that same species. And it has all this fluorescent lights uh, there. Yeah, this and is where Dave Cameron uh, got his inspiration from for the abyss, right? Right. <laughs> and then for anybody that wants to try this, this is called a black water dive, guys. This is um, uh, in mid water and just having torches. I advise you to wear a hood because you see how much of the small stuff is uh, going around. But um, yeah, it's it's like uh, like, like space. I can imagine why you want to study this, Steve. <laughs> Definitely. It's amazing. Yeah, and at night you get a lot of that. That first thing that you showed was a larva of a shrimp. So a lot of the things that eventually live on the bottom or even burrow into the bottom are permanently attached. At some point in the early in their life cycle, they'll have a larval stage for them to disperse far away. So um, you, you get a lot of those larval forms, even with fish and um, crustaceans when you and worms too um, when you do these night dives uh, Simone Philip is wondering uh, what was the depth for this one? Uh, we were very shallow uh, uh, Philip because we were at the end of the dive I think this was not even 10 meters right And it was really the, the last 10 minutes. And we and because Fendi and the other two divers, they already went to the surface. And then I found that shrimp. So I was like, come on, Satoko, we have to do this. Or you <laughs> have to do it. It's a yeah. good way to pass the time during your safety stop, even during yeah. the day. Definitely. Yes. But during the day, do you find those during the day? Yeah, the Tina for these guys don't vertically migrate, but they're just a lot harder to see um, when at night with the light, the contrast and the dark background, it, it makes it a lot easier to see them. But yeah. a lot of things do mi vertically migrate and come up at night. Um, but it's a matter of kind of staring in the middle distance instead of in the far distance. Yeah. Yes. 
exactly. Yeah. So yeah, Great. fantastically shot by uh, Satoka. Uh, just a couple uh, comments from uh, our viewers. Uh, Jose says, I will tell you at the end whether I saw the things you are showing while snorkeling. Okay, great, we'll hold you to that. Uh, Cindy, uh, she's doing better with physio. She's got great news and her uh, lung capacity is above average. So good news, Cindy. Perfect, Cindy. So you will be diving again. That's really yeah. good news. Keep us posted, please. And uh, Ruth is saying good morning. Hi, Ruth. Good morning, Hello. Ruth. Stay safe and happy Christmas to you and your staff. Not yet, not Chris Christmas yet. <laughs> and we can't wait to welcome you again. I'm happy you're still uh, healthy, Ruth. <laughs> and yeah. you can uh, you can see the, the streams again. Eh? If, you if you want to take the time, you just scroll down and you can see all the 33 streams. But nice yes. of you to join us today. And uh, Petra, she is, uh, she's watching from the dentist's office. They'll tune in later oh. again. Yes. Um, great. <laughs> great. Good, luck, good luck at the dentist. So without further ado, uh, Stephen, please, the, the floor is all yours if you would be willing to share your screen. Okay, let me give it a shot. So yeah, I just wanted to um, share with you some of the things that you might see diving as, as we just saw um, in kind of the next to the fishes or in between the fishes. Um, as I mentioned, I work at this research institute in California and we do a lot of our collections sec, using- I, I can't see your uh, shared screen yet. Oh yeah. Oops, sorry. No worries. There you go. Good. Yep, all good. Okay, try that again. So yeah, so yeah. Um, we're gonna look at organisms living in the midwater. We, we use these instruments called a ROV, remotely operated vehicle. Um, mainly this one can go to 4,000 meters and uh, we can collect about, that one can collect about 48 independent samples um, through various suction means. So we search all the way from the surface down to the deep sea floor. Um, most people, you know, are dazzled by the, the spectacular diversity of these tropical places like, um, like your resort, um, whether it's on the reef or in, in the mangroves. And of course, there's just an overwhelming um, diversity and abundance of fishes there as well. But I'm sort of the guy who sees uh, an image like this or sees this this fish swimming by and says, wait, there's, you know, there's a, a jelly in the foreground there. So in this <laughs> case, a tinafore that was um, swimming along. And there's really a lot of different things that we consider gelatinous organisms. Um, most of them are these, the, the true jellyfish. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Yep. Yeah, okay. we can see it. Yeah. So these true jellyfish, and then there's these little guys called hydromedusae that tend to be smaller and clearer. These are all cnidarians that are related to corals and sea anemones, but then these are also related to corals and sea anemones, but they have a very different morphology. Um, but living in the water column, things have a lot of convergence. In other words, they they end up looking the same, but um, coming from an independent evolutionary background. So for example, these things called salps, we saw some of these jetting around in, in Simone's video. They're more closely related to us, but kind of superficially, they look a lot like these siphonophores that are um, cnidarians. There's protozoans, there's single celled organisms. There's those comb jellies we saw, polychaete worms, um, snails, another polychaete worm and another snail. So. All these different things have adapted to living in the water column by becoming transparent, usually fragile, and um, often they can actually be large. Um, they can reach great sizes because they have fewer constraints on um, their development living in this completely open three-dimensional space. So one of the ways that 
um, I actually try to document and study these is through the citizen science um, project called jellywatch.org. And um, we have sightings, as you can see, from all around the world. Um, and you can either go in and browse or search on the map or search for certain terms, and you can also report sightings. Um, so I just zoomed in a little bit on Indonesia and on um, the peninsula there to show that we do have a few um, sightings from that region, but we would definitely take and appreciate um, even more. This is partly to document changes in the ecosystems distributions of organisms, and also just to help people identify um, the things that they're seeing out there. So this is one um, picture that was taken right at Monado by um, Mike Smith and submitted to Jelly Watch. And this is one of the, um, the really beautiful skyphozoans, they're called, the beautiful jellyfish that you might see. There's this Dysanostoma. Um, a lot of them are associated with fish. And here's another one just from right um, right near there. Um, there's also some jellyfish lakes in Indonesia, actually. This is a picture that was submitted to us where um, you get these really highly abundant jellyfish in a semi-enclosed um, space. And then there, of course, uh, this was a picture that was submitted to us. There, there are the box jellies, which you wanna watch out for. Um, potentially, if you're gonna do a night dive, time it um, with lunar cycles. They seem to have a boom and bust period with the moon. Um, but those are really- uh, um, Steve, sorry to interrupt. Can yeah. you elaborate on that uh, last remark? Um, so the box jellies are pretty notorious. They can, um, mm -hmm. we, there, were, there has been some stories about, uh, yeah, quite serious uh, incidents. Mm -hmm. Uh, mainly in the Lembe Strait, to be honest. Uh, what did you say exactly about the moon cycle? Oh, uh, I I don't know how regional this is. Um, I know in Hawaii, so they have um, they have polyps that are attached, and they appear to live up in um, freshwater streams. So they're released out. The medusae are released out at certain times of the month and in Hawaii at least it's very much um, their activity is very much synchronized to the cycles of the moon and I actually okay. I honestly I don't remember exactly when it is but it's like if you um, if you go out a certain time after like the full moon then you're much more likely to encounter one of these guys okay they actually so have the, the, you said it's a fresh water um, in Hawaii, they have their, um, their polyps are in like lagoon type, um, mm -hmm. habitat. All right. So that's, that's most of what I know is about that, not about the Australian, you know, and South, the, the more Southern. So I don't know how much of that applies there. Um, but I, I would suggest maybe you look into it or I could follow up and send you some of the um, some of the literature about that. Oh, that would be but, interesting. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I know they, they definitely have eyes. They have many several eyes at, at each corner of their little cube. And um, you know, I you've probably seen it too, but they'll they'll follow your flashlight. Um, they'll swim towards towards your flashlight beam. Um, so but it's just it's one slice of the the diversity of jellies yeah so um i mentioned our rov so we use the rov from about 100 meters to 4,000 meters but if we want to study the things that are living in the surface we use um this method called blue water diving and it's it's kind of the sister um activity to black water diving so this book just came out um like a couple of weeks ago, I think, or maybe a month ago now. Um, it's it's based, um, it's, well, it's written by this photographer who does, who leads blackwater dives in Hawaii. And even though it is heavily um, slanted towards Hawaiian species, I, it would have a lot of overlap with what you would see um, in Indonesia. So 
I would recognize recommend that as a potential um, resource for uh, identifying a lot of these things. Oh, definitely interesting. Yep. Uh, it's a really nicely laid out book, and he's a really good photographer. <clasps> so I'm gonna <laughs> so taking a step down from that, show you some of the pictures I have of things that <laughs> you might see, um, and try to kind of give you a little bit of a taxonomic walkthrough. So I don't know how many people have seen something like this, um, or it could be a, just a little sphere. Uh, looks like a little noodle. Um, these people always think these are fish eggs or some kind of an egg. These are actually called radiolarians. It's a colony of protozoans. You can see it in the, the slower right one. You can see the individual components of the colony. Um, these are can be really, really abundant in surface waters and even right within the top few centimeters of, of water because they have um, algal symbionts that that are associated with them. And so they they can actually get energy from photosynthesis, but they're also predatory on small plankton. Um, so the scale on this is about uh, the size of like a dinner pea or maybe even a peppercorn for the, the little ball on the right. Oh, wow. um, more like a pea. Peppercorn's a little bit small, but so these little sausagey guys in those those loops, they can be in a, a pancake the size of a coin, um, sausages and loops. But you'll see, when they're there, you'll see quite a few of them, and um, they also happen to be bioluminescent. So if you take them into the dark um, and let them rest for a little while, you might be able to see some glowing from them. Um, oh, wow. There's a lot of pelagic snails that actually live entirely in the water column. This is two, two big categories. The one on the left is called a, um, a heteropod. So you can see the little reduced shell and some of them have even lost that shell. Um, you can see the little trunk here and the um, nose. These people call them sea elephants, but um, these are the eyes here. They have eyes with lenses on them and then this little nose and they flap this, um, this is their foot, but they flap it like a wing to swim through the water. And then this um, side has a different kind of pelagic snail that has a, um, its shell is transparent and almost gelatinous. And then it has this foot. And these, these are predatory and the one on the left, the one on the right put out a mucus net and filter um, things out from the water. Oh, wow. um, You'll also probably see things called ketognaths or arrow worms. This is a deep sea species just because it's a photo that I happen to have, but um, so they probably won't have an orange gut. They'll just be clear, but they'll have a little flared head. And these guys are pretty impressive predators. They have these hooks. So that's not the teeth, but the, their teeth are inside the mouth here, but they have these hooks that they can use to grasp prey. And these again are maybe mm. two, or, two or three centimeters long. Um, but this was a night dive in off Raja Ampat and um, they were just swarming to the light. So they were, it was Aryan, like- you must love soup. this, Aryan. This looks very alien. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they were um, I, crazy. I don't know if you, have you seen them? It, it, not, not so um, close by, um, not up no. close, really. Yeah, of course, the the, 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 the twirly, no. whirly uh, plankton mm -hmm. fish that come uh, to your light. Yeah, we've seen plenty of those, but a close up like you just showed us with, with the, the tentacles and the teeth and the mouth. Mm -hmm. No, no, of course, not that close up. Yeah, these For, look like um, little fish. People often think they're little fish because they wiggle, they, they kind of wriggle when they um, swim, but it's actually a kind of a worm. Right. Uh, for for people like that are amateurs like us, um, if we would bring one of those worms um, back to the surface in a little jar and we put it under a microscope, would we be mm. able to see that face? You would see, you wouldn't see it like this. This is an electron micrograph, so it's with an electron microscope. <laughs> um, but you could see you could see the hooks. They would look like little um, cool. eyelashes on the right here on the side. This is the head, and right. you could see it would look like little tiny eyelashes on the side. Um, 
but yeah, they, they're, I, I, I mean, I love looking at all this stuff under the microscope. If you, if you have, or even a magnifying glass, um, you'll mm. see things that are more alien than science fiction really, because they just, they're not necessarily um, humanoid in form. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you should check them out. You can see here a little bit the head and the body um, of that guy. But yeah, this was just a thick soup of them that, that yep. at that time and place. Um, so another group that I do a lot of work on are these things called siphonophores. Um, you might have heard of the Portuguese man war probably. It's the most well-known of these. But actually, most of them are like the ones that you showed in your video. They have um, propulsive units on, on one end, and then trailing behind them is the, the feeding and reproductive and, and stinging parts. So these parts up here that can't um, feed, they can only just contract and jet out water to, to help them swim. Um, People have trouble understanding siphonophores because a lot of times they call them colonial and then people think of a coral reef. Um, but I like to explain them sort of in this way. So there's um, there's a, a group of medusae of these jellies that are called hydrozoans. Um, they often, most of them have alternating life cycles. So they'll have a benthic stage, which has these little polyps that bud off of it and they can do f feeding or reproduction. And the, the reproductive part of their life is that medusa that you see swimming around. So those pop okay. out of, of a, um, it's called a hydroid that's attached to the bottom. And, so you would um, say that it's a juvenile? These are the actually, I mean, they're just different life stages. These would be juvenile when they first pop out, but then they would grow up to be an adult medusa with, with okay. reproductive gonads and everything. So this is the reproductive form that reproduces sexually. And then this is the, um, the asexual budding form that just reproduces by um, kind of splitting itself or popping out new um, polyps like this. So there's, there's a lot of them that have that. But then if you think about it, that requires them to be attached to the bottom at some point in their life. So in the open ocean, things don't necessarily attach to the bottom, they may attach to whatever substrate of opportunity. So this is one of those um, swimming snails and it has a, a shell that's reduced and its foot that it uses for flapping, but you can see it's been completely covered by these hydroid polyps. And what's pretty remarkable about this one, um, here's a little close up of just how many of them are on there, but this grows up into this jellyfish. So. This is a deep sea jelly that we find and it, its polyps live on those um, swimming snails. So that gives them some kind of a, a substrate, some kind of a foundation to attach their, um, to attach that part of their life cycle to when they live in the water column. But then you think about, well, there's things that wouldn't want to have to do that. So for me, a siphonophore is one of those hydroids that's been just peeled off the bottom and doesn't attach to anything. And so it has feeding bodies that are sprouting off of that main stem. It has reproductive bodies that are popping out. And then it has these swimming bells to, to help pull it through the water. And again, these can't feed, the swimming bells can't feed. So they rely on this one with its tentacle, catching something, digesting it, sending it up the tube and providing energy to the, um, to the swimming part of it, the propulsive part. Some of them have a little float at the top and some of them don't. The ones that you showed in your video were, it looked like uh, this thing called Liliopsis, but it has two of those swimming bells opposite each other, kind of back to back. <clears throat> and then these are the feeding parts and the tentacles down here. Um, and then this is one, that was from Indonesia. But, so it's the same, potentially same kind of species. This one is also from Indonesia. Um, it has a bunch of those swimming bells so each one of these things, and then it has a little float at the top that you can see. And then all this stuff is the stinging parts and the, um, the reproductive parts. So a lot of times if you get stung, you get like kind of a hot wire feeling or you know just a, a zap of being stung and you don't really see anything like a big jellyfish, it's probably a siphonophore. They're pretty good stingers and um, 
they're often hard to see, especially during the daytime. So it might be might be one of those guys. <clears throat> so the other group that I work a lot on is um, it's not actually related to those cnidarians at all. So these are again are the corals and the sea anemones and the those jellyfish that I showed you. But there's another branch in this tree of life that is comb jellies, and it's it's split off from the rest of the animals very early in, in evolutionary history. And it might be the, the sister group to all the other animals. Um, so these guys have a lot of different body forms, but what they have in common in, in nearly all species is these comb rows, these little paddles. And again, they're kind of like eyelashes and these um, propel them through the water. So they're the largest organisms that use cilia for motion. In this case, it also has cilia as teeth. So this one doesn't have tentacles, but it has these um, cilia along the, that line the front of the mouth that uses to bite off or engulf prey. And the mouth is up at this end. Um, these guys have tentacles. So in this case, they're long tentacles that stick out and have side branches on them. They don't have any stinging cells. They just use sticky cells. So they actually adhere or glue to their prey um, to catch them or engulf them or catch them with their little lobes. One um, species that you might see there is the Venus girdle. So this is um, Sestum. This one's a little bit coiled up into this sort of- Oh, I've seen that one, right? Yeah. yeah. And you they see can the be... little, it's like they have seeds in all the way on over the whole ribbon, like little the... brown spots. What is that? Yeah, there, well, there's a, this stripe here is one of the canals yeah. that Again, the, the stomach is here, but it has to get, get the digested nutrients all the way out to the end of its body, which is really flattened and elongated. Oh. And so that has canals that run along the length of the, oh. the ribbon there. Oh. This one also has this interesting brown pigment that we don't know what it does, but if you touch it, it'll start to wiggle or curl up and it'll also frost itself over. So it'll go from transparent to kind of a frosty, um, icy texture, and we think that that's uh, like a daytime flash, in essence. Um, but yeah, those can be more than a meter, more than a meter long. Yeah, yeah, I've seen huge ones. Yeah, huge ones. Yeah, and there's another. Did I, did I did I hear you say that the jelly? Some jellies they have teeth, and they can actually bite. Yeah. Did you say that? <laughs> yeah. I'll show you. There's another picture one over here. I, don't know if you can see it. I mean, they, they they don't bite people. If it, if you look at it yeah. again under the electron microscope, it looks um, really impressive, like a just a serrated serrated row of of teeth. But um, they really use it more like kind of like Velcro. I mean, they can bite off pieces, but they can also um, ratchet themselves. Oh, over the body of another organism so that it's pulling it in by undulating those teeth. Um, wow. So I showed you, this is a really terrible picture, but it was one of the few that I had that's actually, was taken in Indonesia. Um, some of them that have the stingy uh, cells coming off of the side have, this one has these that are coiled up. And so they actually whip and wrap around their prey um, and like a bolo, I don't know if you know this bolo where you th throw the weighted, um, yeah. weighted line to, to catch a, an organism. So this one is a, this is called Euplocamus, but it's a species that enraptures theirs. So this is another shot of the, the kind that have the teeth. This guy's mouth was a little bit beaten up. So the mouth is on this end, the sensory organs on the other end these canals distribute the digestive material throughout the body. But this blue iridescence up here is the sheen that um, comes from those cilia, the, the cilia that are at the lining the mouth. These colors that you see are colors from the strobes that we use to take the picture being split um, by those paddles, by the cilia. So it's not flashing that light or emitting fluorescence or bioluminescence or anything. It's just like if you look at a old, like a DVD or a compact disc and you shine a light on it and you get that iridescence or that um, 
those rainbows, it's a similar okay. thing going on here. Oh, okay. Um, and that's why it changes as it moves because the angle that the paddle is hitting the light is constantly changing. Um, <clears throat> and so you're getting a different part of the rainbow coming out oh, okay. um, as it goes. So you can even see here like the angle, you know, the angle between the light to the comb row to us is changing along the length of this just subtly yeah. and the color of light is changing in accordance with that. Um, if you're doing black water diving and you want to get that um, effect to show up really well, if you shine the light per, uh, from across the body towards it, it shows up a lot more than if you shine it uh, along the length of the body. And also okay. if you use one, one light instead of two lights, then you get a much more dramatic rainbow because the other light is not contributing to that same rainbow. It's just washing it out. So you is might- Is this your picture? Yeah, I mean, this is a terrible wow. picture. These are all my pictures, but um, I, I think- uh, Morning, Dick. Good morning. This one, this one shows a better. This is a another picture. Um, but yeah, if you if you shine the light from both sides, I think it can show up the animal a little bit better. But it, it washes out a lot of the contrast and the the kind of drama of of the shot. Yeah. Um, so with the other body form are these things called lobates, and they because they have these these large lobes. Across the Are end, and they also don't. called sea angel, or angel of the sea. Sea angels are usually the um, the mollusks, those swimming snails. Oh, okay. Um, that have they have two kind of wings that they paddle back and forth. Um, mm. But in this case, they don't have long trailing tentacles that they use to ensnare their prey, but they. Um, they have these sticky lobes and they have these things called oracles. So you'll see these little sinuous undulating things in between the lobes. This one is flying right towards us in this view. So when prey normally would pass between those lobes, but these things are beating up and down. And so they scare that, they make that, um, the prey jump into either this sort of flypaper type sticky part or over here by the mouth that has some a fringe of tentacles hanging down. Um, so that's how lobates feed. And you'll see a lot of lobates, of course, just as I say this, this is one that doesn't have tentacles at all. And it actually, see these white fibers up here, those are muscle fibers. Um, so this is a really, really strong um, lobe on this tenophore. And it can either, it usually grabs its prey, it like engulfs it physically, um, but it also can do an escape swim. So if you see something flapping, almost like a clapping, motion with the two lobes, that's probably this species. This one has these red spots, and if you touch it, they'll squirt out um, puffs of red or orange ink. And then at night, they squirt out bioluminescent fluid from those same spots. Okay, this is not the same as what you said earlier. This is really the colors of that jellyfish, or is this also caused by the flashlight that the That's red dots, weird. these, can you see the row of red dots right here? Uh, not really, actually. I don't know. Can you see my mouse? Yeah, yeah. Does this work? Does yeah, that zoom that the works. screen? Yes, that okay. works. So yeah. uh, those red dots are actually pigment spots. This red color over here is, uh, oh, I love that bird sound. That totally reminds me of being there. Um, these rainbows are, from the flash. So this okay. is actual pigment. Right. right. <clears throat> um, this is a species that has these little warts all over the, the outside of the body um, and really long articles. It's the same one I showed you. This is the one that, or the next one actually is the one in your video that you showed with those orange mm -hmm. pigment spots. So this again is a low bait. There's one that we see down there that is like this which initially, sometimes um, jellies, when they eat something, they'll accumulate oil droplets from their prey. Um, and so you'll see little colored dots all the way throughout the, the organism. But in this case, I looked really closely and these are definitely pigment spots. Um, so all those little orange um, star-shaped things are, 
our pigment spots. So this is pigmentation, and we see this quite a bit um, in this species of, of that organism. Here's the other view of it from the mouth end. And here you can see, again, this is like the last thing that a prey item would see before it gets engulfed, but it's, it's going straight <laughs> toward the mouth. And then these little oracle paddles are helping to knock it into the lobes. And then this one, the tentacles are this fringe of this little mustache of tentacles that go along either side of the mouth. So those have sticky cells on them as well. You said that jellyfish, they eat plankton, or mm. do they also eat other things? Eat, they eat uh, tiny shrimps or uh, fish, or and, and well, then it's inside and they kind of digest it, or how does it work? Yeah, so... Because, yeah? Well, plankton, so plankton is a general term for whatever drift, so it could include shrimp or even fish larvae, um, or th smaller things like little copepods. Um, I don't know if you can see any. I don't see any in this shot, but um, but yeah. So the the prey will depend on the species. So those the ones that have the teeth that I showed you, that's just like a sack and doesn't have tentacles. They mm -hmm. actually eat other comb jellies mainly, um, but the low baits might eat a certain size of shrimp and the ones with the long trailing tentacles might eat a, a smaller size of crustacean called a copepod. Um, some jellies eat other jellies mainly. Um, so there's, there's a, a bunch of different linkages. If you, if you look at the food web, we've done this for the deep sea where we created a little map of who eats whom and it shows, you know, one jellyfish could eat 22 different kinds of other organisms, or there's one comb jelly that only eats a certain kind of worm. Um, so they, they have specialists and generalists um, within the, the feeding strategies of these guys. So I was got, told... Uh, sorry, I've got I one question here from, yeah. uh, from Philip uh, for you, Steve. Mm -hmm. And he's asking, how fast can these creatures swim? Um, I mean, compared, usually pretty slow, but for like in terms of body lengths, it can actually be quite fast. Um, some of these comb jellies, they, they'll, they'll be tiny, just a couple millimeters, but then they'll zip along um, through, the, through the water. And as you saw in that video that Simone showed at the beginning, the siphonophores with their pulsing bells can, yeah. can jet along fairly quickly. They so, were fun, actually. Yeah, it's it's more nimble, I would say, than like actual raw speed. Like you could swim faster than them, but it still might be hard to catch them because they would be so elusive. Right. All right, thanks. Um, uh, Steve, um, I was told that every single night, plankton uh, with the jellies and all the other stuff is coming up from the deep sea towards the surface. Mm -hmm. um, Moreover, uh, when there is full moon, than than other nights. But um, um, if that is, if that I want to ask, if that's true, and mm -hmm. why does it happen? Um, it is true to a large extent. Um, so I like to think of vertical migration in the other in the other direction. Like they would normally be up at the surface because there's more food up there. But during the day, they have to go down to seek refuge from, from visual predators. So I, I kind of think of it backwards, like most people think of, oh, they're normally living down here, but it, the exception is for them to come up at night. So right. some are attracted to lights, like, like a moth is attracted to a lamp. Um, and especially those, those crustaceans, a lot of those were amphipods that were swarming around your flashlights during that video, these little very hardy, fast swimming crustaceans that just come buzzing around. Um, they're attracted to light, but in a lot of cases, deep sea animals will go, um, they won't go as shallow on a full moon as they will on a new moon because they don't want to go beyond a certain light level. So okay. um, they actually stay, you know, they'll come up until it gets to say 10 units of light. And if it's a new moon, then they, that, 10 units will bring them all the way to the surface. If it's a full moon, they'll have to stay deeper in order not to get um, beyond that. Yeah, well, we're, we're talking about full moon and new moon. 
is there any scientific reason why uh, that kind of moon phase would attract more uh, plankton than, for instance, half moon or quarter moon? Um, Is that any idea? I think it, for the plankton, I think in most cases it comes down to just the light levels. Um, so on okay. a cloudy night, or we even saw like during the eclipse, um, Oh, well, and we also had fires here recently where the sky was just, it looked like evening, even during the middle of the day. And we mm. got, there was some evidence that the organisms were migrating, you know, in the day just because of the light cues that they were receiving. Okay. It felt like nighttime to them. Mm. Um, but um, there are things that are synchronized to the moon, like coral spawning and um, worm, polychaete worms that will swim around and do their bioluminescent mating displays um, at a certain phase of the moon. So there are, there's even, I think there's, there's monthly growth rings in some jellyfish. Um, they have sense organs that are like little rocks that you can detect um, different rates of growth. And um, for the moon jellies, the, uh, there's a paper about monthly cycles being detected. So some things are synchronized on lunar cycle, but I think in a lot of cases for organisms, they're just responding to the, the light levels. Okay. Um, I usually, when I take people for their first night dive or mm -hmm. a second night dive, they're, they're just beginners. I advise against too much light. Mm -hmm. at if you want to see those uh, jellies, I think that would be the right decision, wouldn't you say? Uh, a small light is probably uh, better to see them instead of this I, I big think so, yeah. light. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you could see things further away, but it. I don't know. When we do night dives, I strap the light on the inside of my wrist, a small flashlight on the inside of each wrist so that I can cover it and make it go dark, or I can you know, reveal one yeah. or the other of the lights. Oh, that's um, a good idea. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, if you have a, a camera, a video, and you have your fo your focusing light out there, it's, it is sometimes useful to just blast the area with a bunch of light, and or at, at least for other people's benefit. But I think for your vision, and I like to look for bioluminescence and yeah. things like that. Um, and yeah. then you don't get as swarmed by the amphipods because, once you get those guys following you around, it's just hard to see anything else other than that cloud of of little bugs swarming you. It's yeah, like being swarmed by, of, you know, uh, gnats kind of. or flies. Right. <laughs> um, one thing that's kind of in this picture, you see that mesh that, that looks like gauze? Yeah. That grid, oh, wow. those are the muscle muscle fibers that it, it uses to contract its lobe in, in both directions. Um, there's really like these tubes are the canals, but those that grid is muscle fibers that it, um, that it uses. So those are wow. the slides I have about jellies, but I was going to talk a little bit about um, fluorescence and bioluminescence because that's another thing that it's it's a common trait for some of these organisms. You'll see pictures of them that have like a greenish tint to them, and that's because of fluorescent protein that they have. Um, so there's these two phenomena called fluorescence and bioluminescence. And then some people say biofluorescence, but I, I don't ever use that term because um, it's already confusing enough. But to tell the difference, if you, if you have complete darkness and you see light come out, then that's bioluminescence. It's a chemical reaction happening inside the animal that results in light being put out. And so pretty much all the siphonophores and all the tenophores and many of the jellies that you see are, are able to be bioluminescent. Um, then fluorescence, you have to shine some kind of an excitation light on it, um, like a blue light. <clears throat> People say ultraviolet, but really blue is, is perfectly um, good for that. I don't know if you guys offer those like fluoro dives, but um, it's really worth checking it out. Um, what makes it confusing is that sometimes the excitation for the fluorescent molecule can come from bioluminescence. So you have both phenomena happening at the same time. At the same time. Um, yeah. um, 
can I can I ask something about this mm -hmm. uh, bio bio bioluminescence? Sure. <laughs> um, when I bring beginners for the first night dive, at the end of the dive, we switch off all the lights, and I tell them now it's Disney World. You can make stars in water, mm -hmm. and they start waving their hands, and and the whole water lights up. Uh, mm -hmm. That is bio luminescence, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Why? So why is it lightening up uh, on movement? Because it lights up with on the on the bubbles behind uh, the the mm -hmm. outboard engine on your bubbles that you exhale, on your hands that are moving. Why do they light up? Well, so what you're you're in a soup of animals, many of whom have the capability to emit light, and they hold that power in reserve until they're disturbed or stimulated in some way. So in a lot of cases, bioluminescence is functioning as a anti-predator like startle response. So when you're swimming swirling your hand through the water, it's creating shear and um turbulence and then there's just tons of tiny organisms in there and they're getting bumped and when they get bumped they say you know youch and they flash their lights <laughs> so you're you're each one of those flashes is from an organism or in the case of a siphonophore there's there's dots of light all along the length of that um, chain mm -hmm. um so yeah you're stimulating each one of those flashes is a is a another organism that is being disturbed and causing it to uh to emit its it's flash. i will definitely pay attention to the ouch next time <laughs> they they they're used to it i think it's not <laughs> it's sublethal in most cases um so for fluorescence we have to again we have to shine this excitation light on the on the organism it excites those molecules that are in their either tissues or cells um, to a higher energy level, but then it's not stable at that energy level. So it falls back down and re-releases the energy. The energy that comes back out has less, it's lost um, energy compared to the excitation. So you get these longer wavelength emissions, which is less energy than the excitation. So we excite with blue light to see the green or the red fluorescence and then to take pictures of it you put a yellow filter in front of your camera and that blocks out the blue light so i can show you some examples of this but so this is a, a reef here of california but with white light and then the same shot with blue light and a yellow wow. filter in front of it so the yellow wow. filter is not really it's not adding a yellow tint to it but it's just blocking out that excitation light and if you do this on a coral reef it's it's equally remarkable um, this is a fish. This was in Australia, but um, you know, some fish have all this fluorescence that's embedded in their oh, tissue. Wow. We actually don't really know the function of that. But these guys, these guys look like they're a little burning candle, pretty much when yeah. you're flying around with the blue light. So this, do you recognize what this is? It's an anemone. No. Yeah. It's a clam. It's a tridac. It's a it's a giant oh. clam. Oh but, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have um they have algal symbionts and algae fluoresces red, just like a leaf from a tree. If you shine a blue light on it with the yellow filter, it'll look bright red. Um right. because of the chlorophyll. So uh, Steve? Yeah. Al Albert's asking, what about using red light? I mean, we use red light to keep our night vision and to not be detected by the organism. So it won't um, swarm, like they won't swarm you as much if you have red light because most of them can't see it. Okay. It won't, it won't excite fluorescence and you end up squinting a lot. It's really hard to see, um, you know, because red light is absorbed so quickly in right. the water. Um, but we did, you know, for some dives, um, when we're studying bioluminescence, I, I use red light just to to know that what I'm seeing is not a reflection, basically. Gotcha. Um, but in this picture, you can see in the upper part is coral fluorescence. So that's your standard green fluorescence that you get from coral. At the bottom are these um, little isopods that have bright yellow fluorescence, and you see them crawling around a lot on um, corals and stuff but i just thought this was 
it's kind of an interesting, different perspective on the giant clams that, you know, have those blue and iridescent pigments during the day. But if you look at them with fluorescence vision, it's pretty different. Um, we did some experiments to try to figure out why so many things had fluorescence. And this is an unusual jelly called a flower hut um, jelly. And it has fluorescence um, on its tentacle tips. So when you shine a blue light or, or even in the environment, you know, if it's down at a certain depth, the light is essentially blue. So it, it would look pretty much like this, but this was done in a tank. Um, and what we found is that they, they have much higher prey encounter rates when they um, are illuminated by blue light with their fluorescence. So if you look at some anemones, they have fluorescent pigment just right at the apex, right at their mouth there. Um, and so we think that in this case, it also is functioning to attract prey to them um, in the absence of bioluminescence, just in this dim blue environment, fluorescence gives them a way to have other colors of pigmentation besides shades of blue um, because it can convert that blue light into a different color. <clears throat> uh, Steve, Steve, we cannot see this, this coloring if we don't bring a, a black light or a blue light. Um, you, if you know what you're looking for, like this is just, this is a white light shot. Um, okay. And a lot of times you'll see those siphonophore, they'll just have a greenish tint to them. Or mm. if you're deep enough, you know, if you're at maybe 20 meters or so, um, some of the corals will still look red and you'll be like, there's no red light down here, but they're getting the red from, from the fluorescence. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you can get hints of it, but yeah, it shows up a lot better if it's, uh, if there is Prey no would light. be able to see it. Yeah. Prey and would I, be able to see this. Correct. So there's a video. I made a video. I took a laser pointer down. A, gr a green laser pointer and um if you go online it was a link i can send the link in the comments or something but um we made a video called the allure of fluorescence and it shows like what happens with fish when you shine a green laser pointer on the bottom um but basically they they go crazy over it <laughs> um so having said that, you know, we do think that in a lot of cases, the fluorescence is attracting prey, but there's a lot of reports now. And recently there was a thing about a platypus that's fluorescent. Um, that's, it's really not, not necessarily functional in a lot of cases. Um, in this case, this turtle was said to be fluorescent. Um, the red is algae. So that's the same thing that we saw before with the with the tridacna clam. Um, so that's not it. But the shell has this yellowish fluorescent. But you can see even the corals behind it are much brighter than the turtle itself. And if you look at even just our own fingernails or our own, you know, eyes, for example, under fluorescent lighting conditions, it would look like we're also fluorescent. And here's a leaf in fluorescent light versus um, white light. So I just, I think in a lot of cases there, there are molecules in nature that have fluorescence, but it doesn't necessarily imply there's any kind of a function for it. Um, okay. So this has a little bit of, let's see, yeah. So some of the pictures you can see on the, the bioluminescence webpage and there's the jelly watch link and a video about some different kinds of jellies. Um, but that's that's it for what I had. If there's any more questions? Fantastic. I have one, of course. I still have one. Mm -hmm. um, every year, I take the kids from my school snorkeling from the mainland to Bunaken Island, and we leave very early in the morning before six o'clock. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's light, but then once we leave the reef and we are uh, snorkeling at open sea then underwater this is this is my favorite part it's like it's like uh, the cosmos it's everywhere tiny blue fluorescent I think spots mm. um, 
Have you ever seen that? It's only early morning because as soon as the sun, as soon as it is around seven o'clock, they, they probably are still there, but we don't see them anymore. They're in the water? They are and, in the water, yes. Yeah, and they're, it's, like a, it's like a blue, sudden blue, bright blue. Yeah. Um, it's bright blue. Pure and blue flash. Yes. Yeah, those are um, millions, those are probably, millions. Those are probably these copepods called um, Saffirina. Um, okay. We, we've gone through some layers of those with the ROV where it's just like, just sparkles everywhere. They're, they're actually not bioluminescent, but they're really, really flattened. And so they're, um, their body does, uh, it's what's called thin film interference. So it's like, um, oil on water, if you have a thin film of oil and you get those rainbowy colors, the color depends on the thickness of the oil film. So that's why it it can um, take on different colors depending on just how thick that little film of oil is on top of the water. So for Saffirina, they have layers of thin layers that cause those flashes. And I've seen them stack up in like maybe seven of them on top of each other. And so, I think it's a, a mating thing where they can find each other and orient to each other by looking for those little flashes. But as they're, as they're moving about, you only get the flash when they're aiming at the right angle. Yeah. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's probably what you saw. But, okay. um, but it's amazing. So uh, yeah, no, if you beautiful. ever end up at our place, um, we go snorkeling at six o'clock in the morning. Okay. <laughs> we'll show you. <laughs> Sounds good. Right. In the meantime, uh, I've got a question uh, from Philip. He's uh, very inquisitive, and he's asking what kind of training is required you know, in order to research a subject like this. If I just may uh, uh, provide my own answer, I think you need to study at the uh, University of California in Santa Barbara, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, that worked for me, but um, yeah, <laughs> the. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to come at it. So, you know, it depends on if you're interested in the optics, you could study physics. I have friends who are physicists who, who study these things. Um, and then of course, genetics and molecular, um, there's so many questions related to, to genome sequencing um, or ecology and behavior. Um, you know, people, there's a lot of people who do um, photography and filming so I don't think there's any necessarily one path, um, but you have to uh, have to figure out an angle that will let you secure funding for it. Is the you know is the big trick I think. <clears throat> right. Well, that's uh, that's it from uh, our viewers so far. Um, mm -hmm. And the the hour flew by. Very fascinating uh, subject <laughs> right here and. Uh, once again, you know, we always say, Simon, right? It's whenever we um, uh, either we do our own, you know, amateurish studies ourselves um, of life forms, or we invite people like you, Steve, to to educate us on on these subjects. Yeah. We now know how to look with different eyes at these things. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, and Great. Steve, if I will ever be born again, I'm going to study this deep safe plankton thing. I find it very, very fascinating. And um, yeah, I, I would definitely want to learn more about it. So yeah, we'll have to see. And well, uh, Catherine you... has something. Yes, Catherine does. Uh, I was actually going to click on Albert. He says, thank you very much, Steve. So there you go. Oh, yeah. And uh, Catherine says, very interesting. Anytime I had luck to take shots from fluorescent animals, I love them. Thank you for your, for your very nice presentation. Fantastic. Very well. Ingrid, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> And Steve, uh, sorry, and Philip as well. Thank you, Steve, for your presentation. So, um, yeah. well, if you guys get any black water pictures or any daytime pictures of jellies, send them to Jelly Watch, and we'll uh, we'll do. Oh, definitely. Yeah. We'll gladly definitely. take a look at them. Because the weather yep. is getting better, and uh, I still <laughs> want to do those dives. I I think right. I prefer the night ones with um, because they look more alien, yeah. like yeah. space, outer space. <laughs> yeah. And you can see the yeah. bioluminescence. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Steve. I know it's uh, probably way past your bedtime, so <laughs> thanks again uh, for taking the uh, for taking the time out for to do this yeah. for us. And uh, 
I will uh, write you an email, follow up email after this uh, sometime tomorrow. Great. Yeah, and, all right, uh, and thanks to everyone and, uh, for all the questions. And uh, think about my offer, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, for everyone thank else, you uh, thank you very much. And uh, for everyone uh, who voted for us for the Dive Travel Awards, thank you so much for your votes. We didn't win, uh, but we did end up in the top 25, and uh, that means a lot to us. So let's go for that award next year. Yeah. And uh, Steve, good night. Thanks right. a lot. Good night, everybody. Take good care. Bye-bye. And goodbye, goodbye, everyone. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. See you next week, guys. Bye-bye.